realfaith.org.au realfaith.org.au The sad thing for me, Eric, was that I grew up in the 50s and 60s as a kid and most of our stories here in Australia were predominantly British and the, the impression was that our Australian story was sort of second rate. But I began to see how there were people that were like me. They sang my heart music. I think it's so important that we hear stories that sing our own heart music. Welcome to Real Faith. Conversations about the impact faith has on our lives and the challenges we go through. Helping us today and giving us hope for tomorrow. That's real people, real life and real faith with Eric Scadabo. Well, Paul Rowe is known as the Outback Historian, and his book is called Tell Me Another, A Storyteller's Search for Australia's Lost Faith. Well, today we're going to hear the story behind the storyteller, and we'll find out why Paul is so passionate about Australia's spiritual heritage. That's all coming up today as we have a chat with the Outback Historian, Paul Rowe. Paul, welcome to the program. Thank you, Eric. Good to be here. Glad to have you with us. And my first question is, where are you today? Well, I'm sitting in Dubbo in about two degrees. I think it's quite crisp. Must be colder where you are. Yeah, yeah, pretty chilly these days. And we want to find out your story. How did you become a storyteller? Where did it all begin? Well, I guess I grew up in a storied family. I breathed in stories all the time in my family. And uh, when I went back and tracked it as an older person, I began to see there was definitely a huge investment by storytellers in my life. And so I I realized how much I owed to people who told, not only just told stories, but told stories with strong purpose and meaning that strengthened my faith. Okay. And your grandfather was a storyteller as well. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. James Rowe, uh, he was a coal miner up in um, uh, Cessnock and Maitland in Newcastle. And uh, he, he came to Australia as a boy Mm -hmm. Uh, he'd lost three siblings in England before he got here and uh, then when he arrived two weeks later his mum died so he was pretty much on his own with his dad and sister and then he worked as a miner and then went north to Charters Towers and so I think there was a lot of suffering in his life I think Mm -hmm. and I wondered why it was that he developed such a passion to tell stories to children because whenever I talked to old timers who knew him I never met him personally they always said, oh, Mr. Rowe, yeah, yeah. He told lots of stories. They would see him coming home from the mines, mm. uh, from work, and be sitting in the gutter with kids uh, gathered around him telling them Bible stories. Oh, okay. And not only just telling them, but he, he was a, a dramatist. So he, they always – it was interesting because they'd laugh when they talked about him, that he, he was a hilarious storyteller and um, very engaging, a bit of a character. And uh, when I tracked his story, Eric, I found that when he married, he and his wife went up to the goldfields near Armadale in New South Wales, and uh, their little boy, Eric, died there. He was only two years old, and uh, it was a diphtheria epidemic went through. Mm. So, uh, again, another chapter of sadness in their lives uh, with children, children dying around them, Mm -hmm. and their own little boy. And that's what set them on a journey of looking for is there an answer to this? Like, what's the Mm -hmm. meaning of life? And what's going to happen to our little boy? Uh, And will we meet him again? And they went looking. The churches weren't all that helpful at first, but they did meet a Salvation Army girl who said, you know, you need to know Jesus. And that launched them on a warm story of faith for the rest of their lives. And I think that's what triggered storytelling in my grandfather's life. He just had a passion to gather children around him and tell them about the Jesus that had changed his life. Yeah, so you're kind of just carrying on your spiritual heritage, so to speak, from your grandfather. Well, yeah, I mean, my dad uh, and my uncle were great storytellers. They, Wherever they went, they set up Sunday schools or churches or camps. They loved camps and kids. Uh, So that was kind of the, the heartbeat of our family. So I grew up with lots of those things i grew up going to camps and uh, hearing stories and my dad was a pretty hilarious storyteller too and he loved uh, pulling out a big sheet of butcher's paper they didn't have much technology in those days (laughs) and um 
uh, and a black pen and he sort of draw thousands of philistines and whatever and spears <laughs> flying and david and goliath and all that sort of stuff so he 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 generated a lot of laughter and joy in telling the stories so for me my my family life was rich with story and i learned to love the bible i think it was just mm -hmm. uh, normal in my life to to think in terms of the heroes of the bible and i think i i imbibed the sense that Somehow I belonged in this story as well. Mm -hmm. So it's all part of your heritage. Yeah, our heritage is kind of, it can be a bit of a sort of a heavy word to, to use, but I think um, perhaps it's, it, like I said, it's the air that I breathed. It was kind mm -hmm. of natural to us to think in terms of story. And these days when I go into a classroom and I see a big list of uh, values written up on the wall, wall, like respect or, you know, uh, <laughs> courage or something rather. They're good words. They're powerful words, but I, I never learned them by somebody writing them on the wall in a list. I learned them by hearing the stories, and mm -hmm. I, I had heroes yeah. who were like that. They, they were naturally yeah. that way. And my inner world, if you like, was filled with heroes and heroines who were men and women of faith, many of them, and and did those things as a matter, of course, of following Jesus. And so... If you talk about that as a heritage, yeah, it was it was kind of the mm -hmm. the lifeblood of our family. Yeah, it's interesting. You can say be respectful to a child, but if you tell a story of a hero who's respectful and has all the exactly. qualities that you want them to have, respectful, honest, courageous, yep. the story is gonna yep. be a lot more powerful than just say be respectful. Absolutely. I mean we, we were teaching our a couple of years ago in a school. Religious education. Yeah, we're doing our yeah religious education, and the teacher sitting in the corner of the room, but she shouted across us, "Show some respect!" You know, <laughs> really, you know, like uh, <laughs> the teachers weren't all that respectful, you know, themselves. Yeah. And what are the kids? They're going to see it, you know. Yeah. They need to see it modelled. And uh, I guess for my, my life, much of my life, I was around people who also lived and breathed those stories. I was very fortunate, and. And that's how it sort of soaked into my soul. Mm -hmm. And speaking of religious education, you had a RE teacher who had a big impact on you? Yes. Uh, when I was at high school, it was a boys' school, and, you know, being in a Christian fellowship at a boys' school, you can be you're sort of the minority and you sort of, it's mm -hmm. a little bit weird. And uh, so it wasn't quite the heroic thing to do. And a lot of our RE teachers, to be honest, were very boring hmm. and they weren't convincing and they weren't they weren't good storytellers they were not good storytellers <laughs> they were dreadful storytellers yeah. and uh they made this the bible boring as you yeah know? yeah and uh but this one man projected himself into our world he was a fantastic storyteller i don't think i was meant to be in his class but we all sort of smuggled ourselves in there anyway huh. yeah and um he engaged us and it turned out that he was had been a chaplain or a padre with John Flynn, the Flying Doctor Service in the Outback. Oh, okay. So he kind of had the a bit of a bit, a bit of red dirt under his fingernails, and he mm -hmm. he kind of exuded uh, manliness, I think, and uh, the the values that he was talking about, and the energy of somebody who loved the stories of the Bible. And mm -hmm. I think probably without me knowing it, what I had received from my upbringing and, and I saw focused with him in a boys school setting um, was if you read the, there's a part in the in one of the books in the New Testament the, the book of Hebrews and there's a guy there I don't know who wrote it but he, he he's obviously loves the stories that he's grown up with in the, as a Jewish boy growing up in a Jewish household where they told these stories mm -hmm. and it wasn't like yeah once upon a time stuff this was us you know this was our story, this is who we are, you know, mm -hmm. Gideon, Samson, you know, David, yeah. Deborah, you know, Miriam, Moses, you know. So the Jews had this astonishing uh, collection of heroes and more important than anything, Eric, they, they had a very strong sense that their story was going somewhere. Mm -hmm. Like most of the cultures around them thought in cyclical terms. Life mm -hmm. just went round and round and round. You were born, you lived, you died, next generation came along. The Jewish people were very careful to keep their stories alive because they were convinced that their story was a defining story. It wasn't just any old mm -hmm. story. It wasn't just some mythical thing they'd made up. 
But these were real events that really happened to their ancestors. And so not only did they keep their genealogies alive, mm -hmm. but they kept the stories alive. And you can sense in Hebrews 11, this guy, he's, he loves his stories. And he gets to the end, he said, I haven't got time to tell you the rest of the story, but, you know, we're part of this story too. Mm -hmm. And they're waiting for us. It's like, they're like a big, big audience sitting out there watching us in the arena and they're cheering us on to play our part. And then we hand the baton on to the next generation. And so he's saying, don't lose heart. Like, remember mm -hmm. this great story that you're a part of. You are living in an epic, you know. You're not just sort of going to church to hear a Sunday school story, but you personally, you belong in this story, and this story is yours, and you need to, you can contribute to it. You can live like yeah. this. Yeah, well, when you put it that way, it's so much more exciting than just – you know, facts and data and genealogies. I mean, this is a living, breathing story that continues. And as you said, you can be a part of it. That's that's very exciting. And so obviously you're referring to the Faith Hall of Fame chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, where yep. they list all the great yeah. men of faith from the Old Testament. But and that's- women. <laughs> I think it's been... And women, yes. Yeah. And that's an example of knowing their story and inspiring people to be part of that story but you're saying that story continues till today right here in australia as far as the spiritual heritage yeah you're right eric and i think one of the things that grieves me a bit is the way we've learned to tell our bible stories so we sort of teach them abstractedly and that's once upon a time somewhere you know without connection i'm a historian mm -hmm. i mm -hmm. try to train people if you're going to tell the story even to the little kids put a timeline up there Get mm -hmm. pictures yeah. of the place where mm -hmm. it happened. Show them the map. Mm -hmm. Now, make it grounded and real because we don't want them thinking, oh, this is, you know, Cinderella or something. Right, right. This really happened, you know, yeah. and we want them to put flesh and blood on these people. And then the other thing I think, too, is we don't generate this sense of movement and momentum that it's actually all linked together and it's moving forward steadily mm -hmm. to a conclusion, mm -hmm. which is exactly what the prophets of the Bible had. The, the final, they give us a sketchy idea of what's going to happen in the mm -hmm. future. So of all people in the world, the Judeo-Christian epic, uh, the people who own that story, it, it generates hope. It's going somewhere. If you don't know where it's going, there's no hope, you know. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. You sort of making up a story every day for yourself, which is a pretty hard job to do, you know, to get up in the morning and think, you know, what are we doing again? Whereas the Christian has a story that he looks at. Well, also, the stories provide our identity. This is who we are. This is where we've come from, and this is what we're to do now, and this is where we're going. So it provides so many answers to life's big questions. Precisely, and I think even uh, some very significant historians who wouldn't call themselves Christians, like uh, Tom Holland, for example, mm -hmm. yeah. have been saying lately from their, their studies, look, you cannot understand Western civilization without the Christian story because mm -hmm. it moves from the assumption that, that the Jewish people generated in the world was given to them that God had made each individual and valued individuals. You did matter. Mm -hmm. Jesus sort of said, well, even the hairs of your head are numbered, you know, like mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's hyperbole, but it's real. And suddenly if you think, well, my life actually matters and it does matter what I do today, mm -hmm. that the actions I do today can affect in a slight degree <laughs> where this whole story is going, you know, and I can bring people along with me mm -hmm. and give them hope as well. Well, if you're living in something that's throbbing and alive and generating hope, well, why would you give it away? And for me, yeah. That's, yeah. that's what Christian story is. It's, it's fantastic. Our guest today is historian Paul Rowe, who's sharing his life journey with us and why he's so passionate about Australia's spiritual heritage. Next, we'll hear more of Paul's story and about Australia's connection to the restoration of Israel. All that more is coming up when we return right here on Real Faith. The Word for Today is Australia's most widely read daily devotional, designed to give you practical teaching to keep you focused on your relationship with Jesus. Read it online or subscribe to the free printed edition at thewordfortoday.com.au. You're listening to Real Faith, conversations with real people about how God works in their lives. If you want to know more about integrating faith into your life, our website is realfaith.org.au. 
Just go to the website and you'll find helpful articles about the impact faith can have on your life. Once again, that's realfaith.org.au. Welcome back. I'm Eric Scadero, and today I'm chatting with the Outback historian Paul Rowe, and his book is called Tell Me Another, A Storyteller's Search for Australia's Lost Faith. Paul is sharing his life story with us, and he's weaving into the conversation some Australian stories as well. Now, here's more of my chat with Paul Rowe. A person who had a positive influence on your life was author Ian Idris. Am I pronouncing the name right? That's correct, Ian. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he's quite a character, Eric. He um, he walked out of the bookshelves in my parents' lounge room when I was probably a young teenager. I used mm-hmm. to love reading books. And the sad thing for me, Eric, was that I grew up in the 50s and 60s as a kid. And most of our stories here in Australia, maybe it's different for you. I think you obviously come from the North American side mm-hmm. of things. Yeah. But, uh, you know, our stories were predominantly British and the, the impression was that our Australian story was sort of second rate, you know, mm. that it didn't really, a bloke said this to me last Sunday, he said, oh, I had no idea that we had a story to tell, you know, that our story oh, wow. was pretty dodgy. Huh. Um, and um, I assume you set them straight, huh? Oh, well, I didn't have enough time, but I, <laughs> I started, you know, I okay. made an effort. But, well, hopefully he's um, listening today. Oh, Yeah. Well, Ian Idris, he, you know, he, he did that for me. He was mm-hmm. a wandering storyteller. He travelled. He was a, a tin miner. He was an opal miner. He was. A, he did stock work and all sorts of stuff he did. Went to the First World War as a serviceman, came back. But he gathered stories everywhere he went. Mm-hmm. And the 40 or 50 volumes I've got on my shelves of yarns that he gathered from wow. all over the country. Now, he was the first one who really infected me with the idea, wow, you know, these, these stories like, uh, the Cattle King or John Flynn or mm-hmm. Lasseter's Last Ride and all these things. And the Aboriginal people, he, he loves telling the story mm-hmm. of the Aboriginal people as well. Well, I was thinking, well, that, this, is a, this is a whole new world. I, I haven't been introduced to this. Most of the stories I, I was given were sort of English, mm-hmm. you know, Enid Blyton and all those kind of things. And people lived in little cottages with nice stone walls and <laughs> spoke very proper English and things like that. And although Second World War heroes that flew in the RAF or something. Mm-hmm. But I began to see how there were people that were like me. They sang my heart music. They mm-hmm. were mm-hmm. Australians. Yeah, they loved mm-hmm. our country. They walked amongst gum trees, not, you know, pine forests and things with <laughs> yeah. meadows. We, yeah. we had paddocks. We had bear paddocks. They had nice green meadows. Yeah. Well, I think it's so important that, we hear stories that sing our own heart music, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. where we belong, mm-hmm. that talks to us in our own. And the Aboriginal people have said this, you know, when you're on country, when you you feel you belong there and you don't really belong in a place. One writer I read, he said, you don't really belong in a place until you've peopled it with stories, until you've created myths and legends that sort of fill that space with, you know, stories that sing to you. And I think that's mm. what was missing in my growing up. But subsequently, I'm, I'm working on changing that. Yeah. So the writings of Ian Idris really touched a place deep in your heart. Well, they did. And uh, I, I think I mentioned in the book that uh, he he wrote some things about the First World War, for example, the, the light horsemen who'd become sort of fabled yeah, heroes. Yeah, can, can you tell us about that? I keep hearing about the light horsemen, but I don't know what the story is. What, what's the story? Oh, okay. Well, um when the, uh, the Australian infantry formed in the First World War, we didn't really have a, a much of a regular army, but the First World War changed all that. So obviously horseback was a very was, was still the one major means of transport. Motor, mm-hmm. motor transport was only just beginning. So they formed these horse battalions and regiments, and uh, the light horse was sort of, they didn't carry heavy weapons or heavy gear. They, tra- they traveled light, and they could move swiftly and precisely. And I, I met a couple of light horsemen in Burke when I was doing oral histories up there. And as I read Ian Idris' story, and then I met these men, I thought, wow, these are the guys who were there. And there's a very mm-hmm. famous, probably the last cavalry charge in modern history was the the charge at Beersheba that the Australians were involved in, uh, which was on the edge of the Holy Land. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. suddenly I found these stories that I'd grown up 
places that I'd grown up hearing about in the Bible, hey, there was <laughs> there was big big booted Australians riding around in their horses in that very same place. Yeah. And taking back Palestine and and it, placing it in the hands of the British initially and of course then it became modern Israel. But suddenly I found my two worlds coalescing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Bible world that I'd grown up with, which was a long way back. But suddenly, hey, there were Australians there <laughs> stropping around yeah. and uh, being Australian and owning this story as well. So Ian Idris did that with the Light Horse. So he, he the Light Horsemen were, were were a lot of characters. Um, the ones I talked to said they got to Egypt and the, the British decided they were going to train these boys to ride horses. Well, mate, <laughs> <laughs> these, these fellows have grown up riding horses since they were kids all over the back country. And so it, they saw it as a bit of a joke to be taught how to ride. They didn't take it all too seriously, but they were brilliant horsemen and they did perform very well. Mm-hmm. And uh, they played a very significant part in that, that part of the war. So they became sort of legends with their emu feather on the hat and <laughs> slouch hat and their style. They had a sort of an Alarican style. Yeah. Now, speaking of Israel, I understand that Australia had another connection to Israel and the restoration of Israel. Tell us about that. Well, yeah. Um, in the First World War, of course, Lord Balfour made a famous declaration that Britain would guarantee a home for the Jews in Palestine. The Zionists at mm-hmm. the time were pressing for a home in Palestine because it was under Ottoman rule and the uh, it was mainly Muslim who were controlling the country, Arabs who were living there. And the Jews, of course, were being pressured by pogroms or persecutions across Europe in Russia and so on and being driven out of their homes. And so they were looking for a permanent home and the, mm-hmm. the Jewish patriots or passionate people were saying, we need to create a home for ourselves in Palestine. So when Lord Balfour declared that, the Brits took over and they were running the country for the next 20, 30 years. When the Second World War finished, um, the Brits had had enough. Um, it was a very troubled part of the world to try and control. And of course, the Holocaust had driven hundreds of thousands of Jewish people away from Europe and they were looking for safety, a sanctuary. And so they were coming back into Palestine. And the the Brits were very happy to hand it over to the United Nations to try and sort it out. Mm-hmm. That's where Australia came in. Our, Foreign Minister Dr. Evatt became a very significant figure in the formation of the United Nations. He was a brilliant lawyer, and he also was the chairman of the the Committee on Palestine. And so when I was at university, uh, I wrote a thesis Mm -hmm. on Australia's part in establishing Israel in 1948. And it was exciting because I I was meeting these Jewish people in Sydney and I was interviewing them who were there with Dr. Evatt, went to the United Nations. They had been in Israel too. Some of them had fought the British. They they were part of what was known as the Haganah or the the, um, irregular Jewish forces. So Mm -hmm. it was was all pretty pretty fiery stuff. Um, But it was fascinating to realise that Australia had played a part in establishing modern Israel. But then, Eric, I realised... On the other hand, ancient Israel had formed, had a very significant part to play in forming Australia because our country, when the British arrived here, for better or worse, with the colonial story, but they also bought the Bible and they bought people of faith mm-hmm. who did, in fact, try to do the right thing in our country. And many, many, many of the things that we take for granted in Australia came straight out of people's hearts who believe that. God did care for mm-hmm. all people, loved all people, and had a plan for them, and were trying in their best manner to establish something really healthy and good in Australia. So, yeah, Israel and Australia <laughs> coalesced, yeah. and I, I found that fascinating as a historian. I thought, wow, you know, yeah. it's my country. Um, you know, we, we link to Israel. Mm-hmm. Well, the name of your book is Tell Me Another Story, and I want to hear another story, but unfortunately, we've run out of time for this first conversation. So can we have you back to tell us some more stories and tell us more of your story? Mate, this we could go on for years. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll go on That's for another conversation at least. So we'll have you back to share some more. Okay. 
Well, that was part one of my conversation with the Outback historian, Paul Rowe. And as Paul just said, it does sound like he could go on for days because he has so many stories about Australia's rich spiritual heritage. We'll hear more of Paul's life journey and more Australian stories next time. In the meantime, you can read some of Paul's Australian stories on his website. Just go to theoutbackhistorian.com.au and then click on Stories. Once again, the website is theoutbackhistorian.com.au. Well, until next time, when we'll hear more from the Outback historian Paul Rowe, I'm Eric Scadabo. So long, and God bless. You've been listening to Real Faith, and if you have any questions or comments, you can send us a message through our website, realfaith.org.au. That's realfaith.org.au. Real Faith is a production of Vision Christian Media. This program is a production of Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, see vision.org.au. This program is a production of Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, see vision.org.au.